morning. Well, friends, it is so good to be back with you this morning. I'm so excited uh, we had John Brown preaching last week. That was great. Uh, as many of you know, Tracy and I were down with COVID. So, uh, we would planned to be away, so it worked out that we had someone set to, to fill the pulpit. We are both doing uh, much better. Thank you for all of you who have, have shared concerns about that. Um, I want to bring to your attention this card, invite you to fill out that connection card. Um, We'll talk more about this, but as I was uh, as I was watching the service last week, I was reminded that people kind of giggle at this card and call it the card that falls out of the bulletin. Um, here's why it's important, right? This is it's if you attend with us regularly, we've probably got information on you. We probably don't need to know where you live, or you can mark you're already there. But if you are a visitor with us, I want you to feel comfortable filling out this card. And the other option that we've used is having sort of a clipboard you got to hunt down if you're a visitor to sign up and give us contact information. So if you're a regular person with us whose card falls out of their bulletin, I'm going to ask you, bend over and pick up the card, or ask a visitor who is younger than you to bend over and pick up the card for you and fill it out just to model that this is a way that we share not just information with the church and not just a, a prayer opportunity, right? But it's, it's an offering, right? We put it in the offering because our presence here is a way that we are uh, praising God, not just the way we lift our voices and not just our, uh, our words, but just our presence is an active offering too. So that's a long way of me saying, please fill out this connection card. I hope it is good, uh, good to connect with you. I had someone just ask me a second ago about how our Monday service went. Uh, it went very well. We've got 12 or 13 kids that are uh, joining us for confirmation classes, which is just really exciting. And then at 7 o'clock on Mondays, we're doing an alternative worship opportunity, and several of you joined us for that uh, last week, and that was really great. So um, thank you, and, and I do invite you to come join us uh, tomorrow night at 7 if you want to be uh, here for that. We'll be gathering in the, uh, in the fellowship hall. Uh, also want to let you know, if you were thinking, I'm going to go on Halloween night to that new worship service, we're not going to gather on Halloween. So come and volunteer for trick or treat or trunk or treat. And look here, it says trunk or treat here on my list of things to talk about. We need some candy. We need folks who have signed up to provide a, a trunk. Uh, I'm not sure how we're doing on candy. Uh, Wendy, are you back there? How are we doing on candy? Do we have plenty of candy? Well, we've collected one huge bin. But one last, huge bin is great. One huge bin is terrific. But last year, I think we went through three huge bins of candy. <laughs> so I'm getting a little nervous. But if you've donated, thank you very, very much. If you want to donate more, I'm sure we'll go through it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to invite you to do two things. First is to, uh, to support the American Candy Industrial Complex <laughs> by buying candy to support our kids. And three, to keep yourself he healthy by getting the candy out of your own health, out of your your own house and helping to be with our kids. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, something else I wanted to share with you, it's been in the announcements. We've got this prayer list uh, in our bulletin and we're making a, a, a kind of change to how that's being handled. If a name is on this list for, for four weeks, we're going to go ahead and, and remove it unless somebody says that person still needs to be on the prayer list. And if that's the case, we'll leave it on there. If this is somebody that you've asked to be on there and you think they're still, they still need our prayers, it's just, you can... Uh, Hello, Jesus. I think, Trent, I think Trent usually turns those off. And it is still playing, so I, I'm going to talk over them. Please enjoy the bells that are playing under the announcements. So if you have, uh, if you have a name that needs to be on the prayer list, a name that needs to stay on the prayer list, it's just as easy as writing it on that connection card or calling or emailing the office and saying, please leave that name on. The problem, it's not a problem, but something that happens is we just have names that stay on there for a long time and we don't know how they're doing. And, and we want to make sure that um, we have space for others to come to and that we don't just pray out of, um, out of habit and that name is there, but that we have uh, new names and, uh, that are processing in our, in our space as well. So Four weeks is going to be what's on our prayer list unless you ask us to do that otherwise. And that's, I wanted to share that with you and the sort of the reason for that change uh, as well. You'll notice that Trent and Sherry are not uh, with us this morning. They are both, uh, they are both ill. Um, and it sounds like, there we go. Uh, and so uh, please be in prayer for them. So we'll have some pre-recorded music, some other music this morning, but please be in prayer for them. Um, and, uh, oh, 
this is a great opportunity. I'm so excited about this. I've been thinking about this for, for a long time, and Wendy's finally pushed me over the edge on it. As a lot of you know, we have a, a lot of youth that gather with us, that learn about Jesus with us on, um, on Wednesday evenings, uh, and I'm really, really excited about that. One of the things that we do is share meals with those kids, and sometimes it's just because they're kids like me that, as my dad said, had the hollow leg and could not eat enough, and that's how kids are. And for some of our kids, it's because they need a meal, and we're glad to share with them, and that's part of what being in ministry is. So what we're going to try to do is open that opportunity up to the congregation. Uh, Wendy has created a, a sign-up list for meals that you can help share with, um, with the youth starting, in fact, this Wednesday, um, and she's got kind of a list of what to bring, and you'd bring the food on, on Tuesday. Uh, uh, that list is out in the narthex, is that right, Wendy? Yeah, list is out in the narthex. So friends, there are things that we do as missions in the church, right? We, we share, um, I mean, this is just a basic thing. We share flowers uh, in the church and, and folks do that to celebrate love for someone. I'm gonna invite you to think about um, sharing a meal with youth one week as a way of sharing or celebrating love for someone as well. Folks, there are even more announcements than that in your bulletin. I encourage you to look at them. Lots of stuff is going on as we, uh, as we get towards Halloween, as we move towards Thanksgiving. It's good to be in community. It is good to be in worship with you. And I, let me just say personally, it is good to be back among you this week. I invite you as we, as we go to God in worship to take a deep breath in and to let it out. Just take another breath in. And to let it out as we slow ourselves for worship. And to take one more breath in. And to let it out as music invites us into this space.
Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Come, take refuge in the Lord, for God is good. From the storms and struggles of life we come. Come rejoice in the Lord, for God will provide peace for you. From fear and anxiety we come to find peace. Come, open your hearts to the Lord, and you will be given blessing. Thanks be to God for the many ways in which we are blessed. Amen. may be seated and I want to invite any kids that may be with us to come forward for a time to celebrate the kids and Wendy's gonna lead us that'll be great oh <laughs> good morning Matthew and post and unfollow. Oh, this is so sweet. These two make the cutest couple. She's in my math class, and he's also in my cross-country team. We talk on the bus sometimes, and he's so nice. Oh my goodness, he just posted again. They were so cute. Okay. Okay, everyone, smile. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> oh my goodness, 20 likes already. And the lighting in here isn't even that good. Oh, this reminds me. The Facebook account that you made me made, so you can tag me and stuff, only has like three followers. But guess what? One of them is my good friend, John Perry. Hi. <laughs> He's really cool. <laughs> but yeah, as you were saying, Oh, um, uh, well, Mia, Mia, Mia. What? I want to take a dog. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, we're just going to put our cell phones down for a minute. Man, social media can be really weird, huh? Yeah. We can find things there that make us kind of angry mm -hmm. and things there that make us really, really, really happy, right? 
Yep, social media can be a really good thing or maybe not such a good thing. Watching her do this made me kind of wonder what it would be like if Jesus had social media. Well, that might be a I little different. I know what social media is. So social media is like Facebook or Snapchat, right, or Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I have these posters, right, to help us learn a little bit about what Jesus would do with social media. Will you help, please? Okay, so can, Mia's going to ask you to hold that, and she's going to read it, okay? And you can hold it all by yourself. Just hold it up. Jesus would find a purpose for social media, not just a way to pass time. Right, so Jesus wouldn't troll around Facebook or Twitter, and he wouldn't use social media to pass the time. If Jesus opened Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat, he would have one goal, and that would be to point people to God. And that should be our purpose, too, to send someone an encouraging message or tweet a Bible verse or tell someone you're praying for them. You could even post resources that might help others. What does this one say? Jesus would follow, share, and retweet a lot of people, Christians or not. Right. Remember that Jesus ate dinner um, with people who were kind of frowned upon. <laughs> he came to call sinners, not just the righteous. Jesus came to affirm all people, not just those that agreed with him. And maybe we should reconsider who we engage with on social media, too. Except if you get social media like Facebook, you should always ask your mom before you add a new friend. Jesus would intentionally turn off social media to engage with his father. Right, Jesus spent nights alone, and he woke up early in the mornings to engage with the Father. I don't think Jesus would be any different with social media. He wouldn't feel obligated to, repo to quickly respond to everything posted. He wouldn't allow his presence online to distract him from the presence of God. Where you spend your time shapes how you see and respond to the world. So if you're more eager to check your phone than spend time alone with God, then there's a problem. Okay. What does this one say? Jesus would use social media to complement personal relationships and not replace them. Jesus would not allow social media to replace face-to-face -face relationships. Jesus knew his mission depended on people, and that mission was huge. It required courage and faith, so to, to prepare his disciples, he needed to be with them. He needed to build their trust, and that would have been really hard to do online. And you need people in your life who know the real you. You can have a ton of online likes, but your life will feel empty if you don't have people in your life who know your heart. Jesus would fill social media pro profiles with more than Bible verses. Would Jesus post Bible verses? I'm sure he would, but he wouldn't limit his social media profiles to scripture alone. He'd use his platform to show the world a complete picture of God. He'd post pictures of wedding celebrations or funny moments or thought-provoking questions, pictures of our beautiful world and universe. Jesus loves us and he wants us to celebrate the life we're given, so we should try to do the same. Jesus would not post private moments on social media. Right, so Jesus might use social media to inform people about his next stop, or he might post pictures with him and his disciples. But you wouldn't find his most private mo moments on social media. Like when Jesus washed the, the disciples' feet. That moment wouldn't have been for the world. That was a special and private moment. Oh, and we shouldn't post anything that embarrasses or upsets others. God is mysterious, and being created in his image as a layer of mystery and privacy required to maintain healthy relationships with ourselves, with God, and with others. Social media is a huge tool that can point others to Jesus. It's not a tool to troll our friends, or rant about people, or waste massive amounts of time. But I believe that God can help us to use social media to make us better, and not just to bring out our worst. Ready to pray? Okay. Dear God. Dear God. Help me to do, me to do. what Jesus would do with my social media and in all things. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Well, friends, as we go to God in prayer, I want to invite you to share any prayer requests that you may have, joys or concerns. Um, we had a request this morning from Audrey Howe for prayers for her uh, daughter-in-law, Tracy, who uh, went into emergency surgery. And so we'll hold, hold Tracy in our prayers. If you have other prayers to share, I invite you to, to raise your hand. We'll have a microphone that we can bring out to you. Yeah, Tracy. Sure, make me walk all the way up. <laughs> well, and I'm not standing up for this one, so. Um, I am having a knee surgery on Thursday. It's my third one. Um, I'm super excited about it and um, very optimistic that this one's going to take. So just prayers for um, the surgeons and, and the healing process. Yeah, Tracy's knee surgery. Thank you. Other prayer requests? Yeah. This isn't a prayer request. This is just a statement of what God has created. We just got back from the south rim of the Grand Canyon where our grandson is an air traffic controller. And his backyard is the south rim. And it was gorgeous. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a, that's a joy we give for God's creation and the opportunity to experience that. And welcome back. Yeah. Other prayer requests. All right, then as we go to God in prayer, I'll, I'll invite us to, to start with a time of silence, a time to name those who are on our hearts but unspoken, and a time to go to God with confession as well. So let's pray. Almighty God, you who brought all things into creation, we come before you humbled that even though you are Lord of all and Lord of everything, you still see us, you find us as individuals, you give us the love of your Son who comes to us and says, I love you and I forgive you. God, we come before you today with names on our hearts and on our lips of those who need your comfort, of those who need your healing. And we come before you as well with those whom we do not know those who do not know you. And we ask that you will be made known to them, God. That your love will be made known to them. But God, we come before you as well in celebration. And thanks for the joy that you put into our lives. And thanks for seasons changing. For relationships renewed. For the opportunity to connect with others in your name. God, this morning we, we give you thanks that even in the most challenging times for ourselves as individuals, for ourselves as a society, you empower us with wisdom and knowledge to connect with each other to work through distrust, to work through misunderstanding, that we may recognize that in you, in your spirit, we are all bound together. And God, this morning we do give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, the one who showed us what it is to love beyond measure, 
the one who showed us what it is to humble ourselves before the other, to show grace in your name, the one who showed us in life and in death and in resurrection your love and your power for this world and for each of us. And God, hear us now as we pray together, as your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. stand and join me in the reading of the scriptures. Today our reading comes from the book of Matthew chapter 10 verses 16 through 20. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, I'll ask our ushers to come forward. so much into our lives. And yet you also give us opportunity to share you with others. To help you change the lives of others. God, may these gifts be gifts of transformation that you use in ways we can only imagine. Bless them as only you can. Amen. Friends, I will share. Uh, Trent asked if, uh, in his absence, I could play guitar and Tracy could sing. And I said, I play guitar really, really badly. But Tracy sings really, really well, so on average, it should be fine. <laughs> There at the start, before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark 
and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star, a single fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you've said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If the nation seals obey you, so will I. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reference, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to list you high, so will I. God of salvation, you chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak a hundred billion failures disappear where you lost your life so i could find it here if you left the grave behind you so will i I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in a work that you call love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Uh, it's because we are coming up on this midterm election season. 
And we are in a very divided culture, and I want us to think about what that means to us as people of faith. So today we're going to talk about some of the reasons that we are such a divided culture. Next week we'll talk about our call as people of faith to, to mend part of that culture as we can. And then in that third week we're going to talk about what are some of the ways that we can do that. So we, we start with this, this scripture, this passage uh, that has Jesus who is sending out the 12 disciples to go and to share. And, and I love that the message interpretation of the Bible has Jesus saying, keep alert, this is hazardous work. And I think that is so true for all of us who are seeking to be people of faith in a world that may not embrace us in that way. Keep alert, this is hazardous work. And it is hazardous, friends, because we are in a time, a space, where we are culturally divided in a lot of ways about how we interact with each other, about how we deal with each other politically, about how we deal with each other regarding COVID, about how we just are in relationship with each other and with people that we don't know. I don't think I need to tell you that we are in a, a tense time in society. And part of the challenge has been that, that we've reached this sort of divisive state without entirely realizing that it's happening, right? It's that, it's that idea of the boiled frog, right? That if you put the frog in the water and you slowly heat up the water, the frog will never notice it's getting hot and will stay in there and die. But if you, you drop the frog in the boiling water, it just hops right out. That's, that's wrong, right? The, the, that's the analogy we use, but that's not what happens. Frogs are smart. When the water gets hot enough, they hop out of the pot. And frogs are also, they're not, that they're not super frogs, right? If you drop them in boiling water, they're shocked and then they die, right? So it's a bad analogy, but we understand what it says. It says that as things slowly change around us, we don't notice them changing them until they're at such a significant point that it's too late to do anything. And that's in some ways how we've reached this point of division. I want to talk about how, how some of uh, of us got to this point of being so divided. Part of it is, is media, media that speaks to us and encourages us to be divided from each other. Part of it is technology that is around us and provides us the opportunity to isolate ourselves, to silo ourselves, to only be in communication and in connection with those who agree with us, who echo what we believe without having to engage others and figure out how to get along with the other, how to build those bridges with the other. I think I've shared with some of you that I used to work with a youth group in a small town, and we were talking one day about forgiveness, and they said, Pastor Steve, there are 12 people in our class. We can't afford not to forgive each other. Right? But they knew growing up that they had to figure out how to relate to people that were different than they were. But in our society, we've created circumstances where we don't interact with each other as much. We don't hang out with people at church and at school. We have technology that invites us into a space of isolation. And media does drive us away from each other, right? Because for media, for capitalism generally, it is cheaper and it makes more money to make us angry at each other than it is to find ways to help us connect with one another. <coughs> Division drives sales. Happiness just makes people smile. Then COVID came along in this grand intersection of a cultural space and made us become even more divided with each other. In part because we didn't interact generally with other people. Lots of the culture stopped going shopping, stopped going out to eat, stopped going into places where you would bump into people and figure out how to be nice. We met on Zoom and on church with people that we knew and that we trusted, but that was it. We forgot these habits of how to get along and how to talk and how to communicate. And we see this continuing as, you know, if you, you walk into a, uh, into a fast food restaurant and you see someone be very rude to somebody that's not earning a lot of money, and probably is not being backed up by as much staff as they should be, right? So I'm going to say this. Be generous when you are interacting with those people. Be nice to people at fast food restaurants. T 
tip generously in other spaces, right? Be good to the folks that are providing services because they're dealing with people like us who got out of the habit of being nice. Social media drives us into to different corners. It invites us to hang out with people who are just like us. I want to be really clear. I, I don't dislike social media. Social media has done a lot of good. It really has done a lot of good for the church. In fact, in this church, one of the first things I asked was there was a, a slide that said, turn off your phones when you come into worship. And I don't want you to turn off your phone. I want you to turn your phone to silent or vibrate because that's just polite. But if you need to text somebody or you hear something in the sermon you want to share with somebody and post on, online for some reason, I want you to be able to do that. A uh, pastor just told me I need to tip more. The Bible doesn't say that, does it? Okay. I want you to be able to do that. Technology can be a very good thing. And in fact, this, this opportunity we have, hello people who are joining us on YouTube, this opportunity we have to be sharing digitally interaction like this is a great opportunity for evangelism, right? This is one of the, the simple ways that you can connect with others. If you're, if you're on our mailing list, if you get an email from us, then weekly, I think you're going to get a link to that video and how simple it is to take two minutes and, and to send it to someone and say, listen, something in this sermon spoke to me. I'd like you to listen to it too. Or there was music that spoke to me and maybe we can talk about it later this week. Right? A simple, simple act of evangelism. Evangelism is never easy, but sometimes the acts to it are simple. And that's one of them, a simple forward of an email. Technology can be really, really good, really helpful. That is not what I'm saying. And in fact, we're going to talk a little bit about social media, but the, the same issues that we have with social media are, are true in media. That it is a divisive space as well, too, right? Up until uh, 1987, we had, we had the rule that said that the, the stations, our television stations, had to present controversial issues and they had to present different perspectives on those issues. And then in 1987, that rule got removed. And in many ways, our media suddenly became very divisive, very segregated, saying this one is right and this one is wrong. Right? It's not the tool, it's how we use the tool. It's how we choose to be around others and how we choose to interact with them. Now, I'm guessing that there are some of you who are saying, Steve, I don't deal with social media. I don't really need to hear what you're preaching about. But I want to remind you, even if you don't have a social media account, even if you don't have email, even if you do not connect to the internet on a regular basis, your family does, your neighbors, your children, and the way that they interact online affects how they interact with you and it affects how you interact with them. So I understand if you don't have any kind of account, that's okay, but I still think it's important for us to be talking about social media and the way it is informing us and dividing us and traditional media and the ways that we can be locating ourselves in relationship to that media and doing it in a helpful, help, healthy, helpful way. So one of the things I want to talk about, I've, I've called this sermon the evolution of the feed, is I'm going to invite us really to think about uh, when you go to a social media site and it shows you a series of things, whether that's posts from others or videos or links, ways that that has developed. You may recall that early in the days of social media, and I'm thinking about MySpace and early Facebook, it was what they called phase one, it was the, the idea of a chronological feed. It was the idea that what you would see would be what somebody had posted 10 minutes ago. People that you were connected with and what was happening in their life. This is when people were saying, I had avocado toast for breakfast, right? And we didn't really care that they had avocado toast for breakfast, but we cared about that person. So we would know if we say, what's, what's avocado toast? Uh, then there was a shift, right? That it was beyond engagement. And Facebook and other social media companies realized that what was really going to be uh, getting the money was the amount of time you spent 
paying attention to a certain thing. That is, the way that you spent time, the way your eyeballs stay in a certain space, in that second phase. And in that second phase, we saw what we would call clickbait, right? Those things that made you click, that made you want to see and pay attention to something. Carpenter preaches from top of mountain. See what happened to the end, right? You would click this because it was going to be so exciting. But then Facebook had another transition, and other social media, including Twitter, had another transition. That even though this was creating engagement, was creating eyes on the screen, what was even better would be seeing what your friends and family posted, what they shared. What gave you the opportunity to interact socially with them? So if your, your loved one posted a certain video, you might comment on it or like it or share it with someone else. It ceased to be just about eyes on the thing, but how are you interacting with that video? How are you interacting with that idea? And in fact, it kind of went back to that first phase that was about friends and family. And in this third phase, it was what are friends and family thinking about? Now, the reality is, it turns out we don't always agree with our friends and family. I don't know if you have any friends and family, but that's the case, right? That our friends and family would post things that would kind of the same, and our interactions wouldn't always be healthy. But Facebook, other social media companies could say to themselves, well, we're really still encouraging interaction. Then along came TikTok. Now, you may or may not be familiar with TikTok, right? My guess is the younger among you are, right? TikTok is an app uh, that basically does not relate to how you connect or how you follow people. But it watches how long you watch certain videos, certain uh, ideas, and connects you to them based on what you are watching and what you are doing. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are connected with. It matters what you pay attention to. So Facebook has adopted this as well, right? It's an idea that shifts away from, I want to see what my friends and my family are sharing, to I want to see the thing that feeds the idea that I already have. It's not about connection, it's about performance. Now, that's not an inherently bad idea, but it means the feed has now gone into what we call phase four, the idea of discovery. I'm discovering who has done something interesting, and more often than not, interesting means divisive. I want to watch the thing that reminds me that I'm smart and that other people aren't. The idea of discovery. It used to be that we might follow somebody because they created interesting content. They would make beautiful music or do pretty dances. And we could rely that when we saw what they were going to do, it would be interesting. But this idea of the discovery feed means that we just see things that for in this moment, in this clip, engage us for whatever reason. Now the result of this is that we cease to be people who are connecting with one another and we become people who are performers or who are observing performers. Now again, to be really clear, while I'm talking about this in the context of social media, this is something that has been around for a long time, right? The fact that we are becoming performers rather than engagers is the same complaint that happened when radio came along, when cinema came along, when television came along that we ceased to be engaged with each other, and we were just watching. It wasn't about relationship. It was about observing passively and being reminded of, we believe one thing that others do not believe. So we become divided, we become separated into those who are doing, who are creating, and those who are watching. And if you think about music, right, this is a development we've seen in music in the last hundred years and change. It used to be that we would sit on the porch, we would sit in the parlor, and, and somebody would play guitar, and somebody would sing, and somebody would play the banjo, and somebody would play the violin. And it wouldn't be the most beautiful thing in the world, but it would be all of us creating music together. But then technology created recorded music. Music ceased to be something that we participated in. And it became something that we listened to professionals do. It became something that we observed. We were not doing, we were observing. Or we were performing for the benefit of those around us to praise us. 
And this is where social media, as of today, and it's going to change tomorrow, but as of today, is headed. Now the reality is that for people of faith, or people who think they might want to be following Jesus, this idea of performance is kind of antithetical of what we're called to be. We're called to be humble people. We're called to be in service to each other. We're called to engage with each other. And we're called to be active participants in this world. Last week, as we started our, our new service, I engaged with some adults and a whole lot of junior high kids in this room. And someone referred to this space as the stage. And boy, howdy, I had to bite my tongue, right? That this is not a place of performance. This is a place that we gather, where all of us, you and me working together, those of us online, seek to encounter the divine. Now, that's not the problem with the person who said it. That was her perception of what this looked like, and that's a challenge on us to educate those around us. That this isn't me speaking and you listening. This is all of us working together. It's me listening to you and you listening to me, and we raise our voices together, and we pray together, and we sing together, and we are, we are celebrating this for God, for Jesus, for the one who loves us so much that he brought us into creation, that he sent his son to die for us, who gave us grace and gives us grace throughout our lives. And that challenges the idea of the feet, of the TikTok feed, the Twitter feed, the Facebook feed. Because it feeds, no pun intended, it feeds on our human perceptions. It feeds on our human brokenness that says, I want to know that I am better than the next person. I want to know that someone else is dumb and I am smart. This is part of our human brokenness, but that is exactly what these algorithms feed on. And you can't blame them, right? I mean, that's what gets us eyeballs on the screen is our, our human brokenness. And one of the things that we need to know as people of faith is we are big targets of taking advantage of that perception. In 2019, MIT released some documents that indicated that of the top 15 Facebook pages aimed at Christians, right? So these are the 15 most popular Facebook pages that Christians would engage with. All 15 of those were run by troll farms. In other words, what you would get would be pretty picture with scripture, pretty picture with scripture, pretty picture with scripture, statement made to disrupt our societal being. Pretty picture of scripture. 15 out of 15. Because sometimes we are innocent as doves without being wise as serpents. Our faith, our belief that we are created by a loving God who calls us to be active in this world, calls us that we need to be engaged and be aware of how the world is being influenced by these tendencies. Jesus tells us to love each other, to love God, to love the world, and that means loving everyone, even those that we disagree with, even those who disagree with us, even those that we, we intuitively roll our eyes at. Jesus says, love them. Jesus says, love them, but when you do it, be as innocent as doves, and as wise as serpents. Jesus uses that phrase as he is sending the disciples out to be in the world, and the same goes for us, right? Just as they were going to be itinerant, as they establish the church throughout Jerusalem and throughout the world, we have the, the privilege of being intellectually itinerant. We can choose what to read, what to expose ourselves to, what to share with other people. Jesus also warns the disciples that you are going to be brought before those who will oppress you. And it's easy for us to think that in, in 2022, as people of faith, we're not going to be oppressed. And if we just say, well, we're Christian, that's probably right. We probably won't be oppressed. 
But if we commit ourselves to loving with the depth of love, the fullness of love that Jesus told us to love in, a love that eclipses party, a love that eclipses politics, a love that eclipses family, a love that eclipses nation. Yeah, we should be ready. Because there will be people that do not care for that. Be wise as servants. Be innocent as doves. Now here's the good news, friends. We are created in the image of God with the ability to be wise, to discern, to think about how we interact with others, to think about how we interact with media that is set before us, to choose how it is that we interact in that way. And I'm going to invite us in the week ahead to think about how are we interacting with media. And I'm going to give you some, some thoughts to consider, some encouragement. First, I want you to think about prioritizing the written word over videos. And by the way, these are things you can encourage family and friends to do as well, right? Prioritizing the written word over videos, right? Because written word is a much better tool for complex ideas. Also a better tool to trace back who actually said something. A better tool for the structuring of complex ideas than simply watching a video. And I will say this is a challenge for me because I have a great tendency to listen to radio rather than reading the news. But here we are. The written word is power. Second, I want you to be willing to look beyond the headlines, right? This is something we get from our print media. I know that print media is not something that we think is going to be around for a long time. But we remember that in a lot of print media, the people that, that write the articles are not the people that write the headlines. And as we watch online, those headlines are things that are built to draw us in. So we move past the headlines and get to the content. Years ago, really decades ago, Jesse Jackson used to tell the joke. He said that I was on a boat, Jesse Jackson was on a boat with the Pope. Wind comes along, it blows the Pope's hat off into the water. Jesse Jackson walks out on the water, picks up the hat, brings it back, and gives it to the Pope. And the headline the next day says, Jesse Jackson can't swim. <laughs> it's not the headlines, right? It's what the headlines are pointing us to. Pay attention to the content. Think about what you are exposing yourself to. Is it a balanced set of, of media exposure? Does this particular media outlet that you use, are they willing to give different perspectives on a given idea? Are they willing to criticize the, the person or the party or the idea that, that they generally support or that you general support. Be aware of times that you are looking at news that is not actually news, right? Malibu Star shows us her new living room, right? That's, that's interesting and it shows up perhaps on news programs, but that's not news, that's entertainment. We need to recognize when we're watching Malibu Star showing us her new living room, that's entertainment, but it's not feeding us something that will change our lives or affect those who are around us. We, when we engage with media, we have the wisdom and the discernment to be looking, to be seeing, to be saying, why is this affecting me and how is it affecting me? And how can I, as a person of faith, respond to this in a loving fashion? Or share it in a loving fashion? Or see someone who is sharing and say, hey, let's sit down for a cup of coffee in real life and talk about this. Because I love you, I want to share love with you, and let's connect about this. We don't have to agree on everything. But we can talk to each other and connect with each other. By the way, folks, this is stewardship, right? We often think about stewardship being about how we care for the money that God has put into our lives. But stewardship is also how are we taking care of ourselves? How are we tending to our own minds, our own beliefs, the way that we invest our energy, the way that we invest our time? So in the week to come, I truly invite you to think about how you are engaging with media, whether that is social media, whether that is broadcast media, 
whether it is print media, and to think about how it is informing you, how it is informing your attitude, and how it is informing how you engage with others. And as you do so, I invite you to take to heart Christ's call to be innocent as a dove, but wise as a servant. Amen. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. And we give you thanks for creating us with wisdom, with the ability to connect with others, with your Holy Spirit that moves us and guides us. May we never turn away from you, even as society calls us to turn away from each other. May your love guide us to turn into each other again and again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And friends, as you are able, I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we join in our closing hymn. <coughs> May the Lord God surround you with his love and with Christ's grace, that in all things we may be beacons of his love to this world. Go in peace, go in love now and always. Amen.